Hi everyone, my name is Paul Stack. I work for a company called Pulumi, and this is my talk on infrastructure as software. You can find me on the internet at Stack72, and you can also email me if you have any follow-up questions, paul at pulumi.com. So right now we're going through this cloud transition in, um, in infrastructure management. And what I mean by that is that, you know, whether we're forced to go to the cloud or whether we're taking advantage of the cloud in order to make sure that we're able to uh, move faster for our customers or scale out better or be able to cope with demand, at some point, companies have started looking and, and actively moving towards the cloud. Now, there are a number of ways in which they can do it and a number of variants in how they do this. And these are a few on the screen. So we have our traditional V1 where we've effectively picked up our data center and we've moved it to the cloud. And it's very much a static style cloud. You know, it has web servers, it has database servers. There's a load balancer probably in there that accesses the, the internals of the system. And it's, um, you know, long lived instances that, that tend to be managed by a configuration management tool. Then, you know, we have companies who have moved away in a different direction they've gone for a much more transitional style architecture where they're taking advantage of vms and maybe experimenting with containers it's a little less monolithic it's much more a hybrid cloud between public and private sort of interactions with how, with, with what's happening and they're more than likely taking advantage of an infrastructure as code uh, an infrastructure um software vendor something like you know um a monitoring agent or databases on the cloud, and, and they're able to do a lot of different things in that direction. And then you have people who have re-architected for the cloud. And when I say re-architected, they've gone for a much more modern style of infrastructure where it's you know definitely um, using a container hypervisor, something like Kubernetes, HashCorp Nomad, you know, they're definitely taking advantage of data stores, possibly taking advantage of functions. And you may have heard this called like microservices or cloud native or anything you want here, but we call it at Pulumi a much more modern style architecture. Now there are three ways to manage the cloud and they tend always to start with, you know, as, as people experiment with the cloud, they go and they have a look around the web console. They click around the portals, they provision some resources, they try and make the resources talk to each other. And it's very difficult to scale for um, the, that level of resource. You can't really recreate it every time correctly because we're humans, we make mistakes, we cut corners. And as, as it needs a manual interaction, you need people to be available to scale up when demand is required. So there are companies who move beyond the portal and the console and they've actually gone for CLI tools and scripts and templates and it's a much more automated workflow and it is able to be versioned. But as these tools are um, used, they actually need to be, um, to be made reusable. So item potency is a big thing here when you're running scripts against the cloud uh, to be able to understand state maybe, what happens when updates are, are, are made, you know, there's a, you have to implement some of your own update strategy. And some cloud vendors are actually offering these by default. So you have cloud formation by AWS, you have cloud deployment manager by Google, and you have Azure resource manager ARM templates by Microsoft. And then there are other tools in this area as well. You know, this starting to move away from this templating towards item potency, or excuse me, towards um, much more cloud agnostic tooling, uh, much more uh, programmable tooling around the cloud. And that's where tools like Terraform and Pulumi and all these different things come in. So it's actually writing resources just like you would write software. So you can create your APIs, you can create uh, modules, you can actually wrap reusable code away so that people can actually have a nice API service area. And this allows us to be much more scalable and allow us to actually interact in a, in a, in a bigger way with the cloud. DevOps is transforming everything to do with engineering organizations right now. So we used to have this scenario where it, it was always a centralized ops team. Developers would fire packages across the centralized ops teams. The ops teams would manage the environments. It would be difficult to get the environments created because it was only a centralized team that did it. And the ops teams would also more than likely deploy your software for you. Now that's broken apart in a lot of different ways. 
And it tends to be now we have like specialist security teams, specialist application teams. You even have things like DevOps teams, infrastructure engineers, SREs. There's all these different things. But what's actually happened is ops are no longer the gatekeeper by being the centralized area, but they're now the enabler for the organization. They actually empower teams to be able to build infrastructure on top of the base infrastructure that they actually have created. Let's think of a Kubernetes um, system. So the operations team, the SREs, whatever you want to call them, would actually build the infrastructure for you. And then they would share cube configs, specific configurations that would allow you, or the application team, to deploy applications and, and um, other pieces of infrastructure into that centralized environment. So we're very much moving in this idea where we're heading towards cloud engineering. Really important, just a very quick recap, what is infrastructure as code? So it is eliminating manual, error-prone provisioning changes. It's bringing best practices to your infrastructure management and allows you to gain previews and um, see changes of what's actually happening in your code. Why do we care about it? It's automated and repeatable, I just told that. Um, it's much faster to get your systems, new systems and existing systems up and running. And of course, it's much more predictable because we're able to get previews and understand what the changes are that it's going to be. But at Pulumi, we actually like to say we are modern infrastructure as code. So not only do we have you know, that deploy flexibility with CLI so that we can integrate in the CI CD workflows and be able to get all the changes, but at a much lower level, we actually use uh, programming languages, which means that you can start to create and, and share abstractions within your organization and also externally, of course, and be able to use your favorite tooling that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, your IDEs, your testing, your linting tools, all these different things that give you much more familiarity about what you're going to be deploying into your system. Now, of course, as we're in code and we're actually pushing code through um, our source control, we can then start to do things like semantic versioning, testing, code reviews, bringing all these development practices that we've been doing in the um, application and the, and the um, software side for years into our ops side. And that's why at Pulumi we're starting to phrase this as infrastructure as software, because we understand that as applications grow, infrastructure has to grow as well. And you cannot just continue creating this monolithic ball of infrastructure code. You actually have to shape it, refactor it, test it, move it forward, start to create abstractions, version it, so that and it grows in exactly the same way that application code grows as well. Now, a quick bit on Pulumi. Pulumi actually has a foundation of providers. These providers allow you to talk to clouds or infrastructure as code vendors. Then based on top of these providers, we have started showing that you can create libraries or APIs for specific um, jobs. So like serverless, layers of abstraction, containers, layers of abstraction. And then we've even bubbled that up into some of we're actually calling Pulumi Crosswalk, where we can hide away a lot of that abstraction using the best practices of a specific cloud and actually allow developers and operators to be able to deploy things easier. Now, what I mean by that is in Amazon, if you want to create a VPC, your own VPC, you need the VPC, you need subnets, you need an internet gateway, you need route tables, you need routes, you need route table associations, you potentially need NAT gateways, you potentially need elastic IPs. Now, having to create all these pieces of all these resources and all these pieces of infrastructure together actually makes life quite difficult to do this um, unless you're doing it regularly. So you'd have to read documentation and it, it will be painful um, for developers who are not akin to doing this to do it all the time. So in Pulumi, we've created this um, AWS Crosswalk library where you can specify in a single line of code a new VPC and we will take care of all of the best practices, the common best practices that Amazon suggests around the scaffolding of a VPC. And that's only because of the fact that we're able to take advantage of the language runtimes and be able to create these layers of abstractions, APIs that people can actually write code against. So we can deploy code from anywhere to anywhere. So source code, 
uh, in our in our source code repositories um, in different languages. Pulumi supports JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, Go, C Sharp, F Sharp, VB, and the, you know there's the ability to add other languages as well. Um, it has CI CD um, integrations. There is actually a Pulumi Spinnaker plugin, so it's very nice that we're actually be able to be part of the Spinnaker event, and um, you know it, it, it allows your infrastructure to be really embedded as part of your CI CD and your Git um, ops workflow. Now environments, it can talk to multiple environments at the same time. You can be deploying code to Amazon, to Azure, to Kubernetes, to VMware, to OpenStack, to DigitalOcean, all from the same Pulumi application if you so wish. It doesn't matter. Now, even though we're using real code, it's important to understand that Pulumi is declarative by default. So every Pulumi resource um, has the, the normal, it, it follows a, a common pattern. So we have a name for the resource, we have some arguments for the resource, and then we have some condition of some Pulumi custom specific options if you need to embed them as part of the resource. Even though it is declarative, it is written with imperative languages. So it will work its way down the page and it will allow you to create dependencies between uh, the different pieces of the system. So you'll see here that I'm creating a security group, then I'm creating an instance, and then after the instance, I'm actually saying that the security group, that the instance needs to be created, references group.id. And then we can export some uh, information off the back of it. So we've actually built an explicit dependency between security group and instance, and Pulumi understands that it needs to create that security group first before it creates the instance. Otherwise, it would try and do as much of it in parallel as possible. Because we're using language ecosystem and the runtimes, we actually get programming primitives by default. So we can take care of conditionals and loops, we can take care of uh, lambdas, we can do all these different programming functionality inside our application. So here you'll actually see that if a config variable that's being passed in called public subnet ciders is not equal to nil, then we need to actually loop over all the values in that public subnet ciders and create a new subnet based on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pulumi can take care of multi-provider workflows. As I said, we can deploy in lots of different places at the same time. But we actually can start to create real APIs, real reusable libraries that you can pass around inside your company registries, you know, whether it's NPM or PyP or just in your source control that allow people to actually take, um, create simple layers of abstraction to hide away complexity that, um, that, that other people don't actually need to care about. And then we can start to take advantage of advanced orchestration. So here you will see that we are creating three replicas of a deployment in Kubernetes. After we create our, uh, we deploy those three replicas, we then are able to talk to Prometheus because Prometheus has an SDK, it has an API, and we're able to pass in the name of the deployment. We're need, able to check the application metrics that are based on the back of that. And then we're actually, once we're happy and satisfied, we will continue on with the next set of replicas in the cluster. It tended to be up until now that this would have had to be done by a lot of different tools. So we would have deployed once, we would have gone to our, our metrics console, we would have checked it, we would have then come back and we would have had to redeploy it based on, um, on changes again. So we can actually embed it all in one workflow. Now, one of the things that Pulumi actually says is that we want to bring engineering practices in here, and that includes testing. We all know that testing our infrastructure usually means spinning up resources, testing that the resources have been created as expected. But we know that if we pass specific parameters to a cloud, it will act correctly. And what we're actually usually doing is testing that the cloud themselves have done what we have asked, not our internal logic. At Pulumi, we can actually mock the cloud, the requests and the responses from the cloud, and we can actually run tests of our infrastructure code in milliseconds rather than waiting for resources to come up, which means it's cheaper and it's got a much faster feedback loop for people. And the last major feature for Pulumi, which is probably my favorite, 
is that Pulumi has a secrets manager by, uh, built in um, to it. So we will actually allow you to um, encrypt your secrets by default when you use Pulumi so that um, we're trying to ensure that we're being uh, best practices around security. And it will integrate with Amazon Key Vault, or Amazon KMS, Azure Key Vault, or GCP KMS, and how you go Vault. So, you know, there's options that people can use in order to do things in here. So for us, Pulumi empowers cloud engineers to deliver fast, quickly, deploy confidently because we have our testing, operate securely because we have this um, secrets manager built in, and of course, scale easily because we can create these layers of abstraction that allow us to interact in a faster way with Kubernetes or serverless or containers or any of the different parts of the system. So let's write some code and actually see what it does. Now, by default, every new operation, and Plumi is a CLI based tool, okay? And you'll actually see in the CLI, it gives us some output that helps us be able to understand what we, what we should do with Pulumi. Now here it says, you know, begin working with Pulumi, run the Pulumi new command, okay? Now if I run the Pulumi new command, it will offer us a wizard of uh, pre-packaged templates that are specific to a cloud vendor that means we can get started faster. So let's choose AWS TypeScript today. Let's give it a project name. Let's say Spinnaker one. Let's give a pro, um, we don't need a description. And then we have this idea of a stack. A stack in Pulumi is a set of configuration and the um, state of the resources that have been deployed segmented from each other. Think of an environment for staging, testing, production. Each of those would be specific stacks. They can have their own configuration values and they can be independently deployed to. But of course you can also make it each developer has their own stack. A stack sits on top of a project, which means everything inside the stack can access all the resources to be deployed from the project. So let's say dev. And because this is an Amazon, we can, uh, it, it will ask us what region we want to deploy into. And it'll just go and install some dependencies. And once it's finished installing the dependencies, it will actually give me all of the pieces that I require to be able to get up and running with a Pulumi application. And you'll see it's installed some plugins and you're ready to go. And if I just open my ID, uh, what you will actually see is that it has created, uh, it has the node modules. So it has got all of the dependencies that it requires as a git ignore because it's for best practices of, of not checking in node modules or bin folders. It has a package JSON and a package lock JSON uh, uh, and files that specify the dependencies that are required. It has a pulumi.yaml, which suggests the name of the project, the runtime, it's TypeScript, JavaScript, and it has the description, and it has a TS config because this is TypeScript. So, you know, this enforces the best policies. But then it has pulumi.dev.yaml, which is a stack specific configuration. So the dev stack can be in US West too. The production stack can be in US East too, and so on and so forth. And then we have the index.ts. Now the index.ts file has three parts to it usually. So we have the helpers, and these are importing the cloud specific libraries, the Pulumi libraries, and then we have crosswalk. So crosswalk is this, this layer of abstraction for the best practices around uh, VP, uh, AWS. Then we have resources, and then we have exports. So these exports are used to give information back to the user uh, if they require it. So for things like uh, URLs or um, IP addresses or whatever they actually need to be. Now that is a Pulumi application right there. And if I run the command Pulumi up, what Pulumi will do right now is it will perform a preview based on what this infrastructure has against what is in the cloud I am targeting. So I'm targeting AWS, and it's going to see that it needs to create a bucket. And we can actually see that it's going to create a bucket. And we can say no, okay, because it's not really interesting to see that. But I wanted to go and um, I show you about the secret side of it. So I need to install a package, and the package needs to be random. This is just some random data that we actually have uh, available that people can use and uh, be able to bring into their environments. 
And what we can actually see is, let's delete all of this, and I can say import star as random from at Pulumi random. And we are going to say const my secret password equals new random dot random password. I'm going to call it demo. And we're going to give it a length of 30. And we are going to say it wants special characters. Okay. Uh, at that point, we actually have something that we can, you know, a resource, if you think of it. And then let's export uh, the value. File one equals my secret password dot result. So let's go back and let's rerun Pulumi up here. And let's let this run through the whole system. Now we will have a random password, but Pulumi doesn't know that this is anything to do with a secret value because it is just a resource. Now, of course, that is now here in the output, but it is also in the Pulumi state right here. And we don't want that, okay? We actually want the ability that we can make things secret by default. So we can take advantage of the secret engine. Um, two, let's call it demo two. And let's actually export value two here. Now, we have, as part of a resource constructor, we have a name, we have some arguments, and then we, I, I said earlier, we have Pulumi custom resource options. One of the Pulumi custom resource options is additional secret outputs. Now, any output from the random password class, okay, and here are all the outputs, length, lower, min, all these different ones can be pushed through a Pulumi secret engine to encrypt it. So let's say we actually want to push result through the Pulumi secret engine and encrypt that before we export it coming out of, the, of our CLI tool. And if I go and run Pulumi up, now you'll see again, it's gonna create a new resource and we'll see it's an output of string, so it's a promise, okay? It's a promise that is gonna create it because we don't know what that value is until it has been created. And let's say yes. But instead of getting the raw, plex, uh, raw uh, text string uh, in, in our system right now, we actually have a secret value. And uh, the secret value is even kept going through the system in our stack because we're actually telling it we want it to encrypt that specific value so we can push that through. And anywhere that is used, that will be a secret. And if I Pulumi Conf, so we have to say, if we want the ability to set values into our system as well, if we want Pulumi Config set, and I'm gonna say my secret password, and I'm gonna call it password one, two, three, four. And if I go back to my stack, well, you'll actually see that it is in plain text because Pulumi doesn't know this is a password, but we can actually run the same command with dash dash secret. So actually tell Pulumi it's a secret by default, and we'll see that it is secure and it has been changed. Now, of course, if somebody goes and compromises our KMS key, we would like the ability to be able to change that. So we have this, you can rotate your secrets. I want to change my the, the um, KMS key that I'm actually using. And notice here it's AAA, it starts with. And if I run the same command, which will change my secrets provider, it has completely changed the secret and um, it's now using a AWS KMS. So we're trying to make this secure by default. This is something that's extremely important for us. Now, just to go a little further, I can actually hide some of this code away. Now, if I say, uh, let's call it class, my secret, uh, I'll actually call it, let's call it password generator.ts. And I want to export a class uh, which will be called password generator, which will extend resource. Then at that point, we actually have uh, something that's reusable. So let's import star as Pulumi from at Pulumi Pulumi component resource. Here we go. So we actually have a class now, and that class will allow us to do a lot of different things and hide um, some code away. So the first thing we need is we need a constructor. Uh, nope. So we need a constructor. A uh, constructor has some properties that go with it. Now we're gonna pass in a name, which will be a string. Um, we're gonna pass in a password length, 
which will be an int or a number, I apologize. Okay, so we actually have um, ability to push some, some information in. So now what we actually want is we want to be able to push some information back out. So if I say public read only string, um, the string will, it's, uh, yeah, let's call it uh, generated password. Uh, now I can actually move this this logic inside. I can say this dot generated password equals new. Uh, let's import star as random from at random uh, equals new random dot random password. We want to pass in the name here. Apologize. There we go. We actually have the name being passed in. Then we want to say the length will be password length. And we will say special true. And then at that point, we actually have a class that we can use. And we actually don't even need the component resource here. We can just, uh, just remove that and take it away. So at this point, back in my code, I can actually say const generated password equals new uh, generated or new password generator. We'll call it demo one. And I will say that I want a 30 character string going through it. Now at that point inside all of our system, we need to give it um, of type string because it is a specific string. Uh, actually, it's an output of string, I apologize, uh, because it is a specific Pulumi output. It's a promise based on what's actually going to happen here. And uh, we can then start to be able to enforce specific code in here where we will always pass the additional secret output for result. And then that way, when somebody requests a random password for our system, we actually will enforce it by default that they are getting um, everything that they require. So if I say result, and at that point we actually have a password, and uh, let's export const my password equals generated password. Let's go back and let's say pull me up, and let's see what it does. So you'll see it has a new generated password, is of type secret, and let's say yes. And we've enforced a best practice on our system. And because we've enforced a best practice on our system, we cannot leak secrets. So we've created that small layer of abstraction in a language which allows us to actually be able to keep that and wrap it away. So in conclusion, we actually believe that Pulumi is the easiest way now to program the cloud and programming the cloud and programming our infrastructure actually becomes same style, the same workflow as um, application software. So we, we follow the same development cycles, the same testing cycles, the same security cycles, everything in our infrastructure. And we hope that uh, we're, we're trying to enforce best practices in the cloud engineering community going forward. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, my name is Paul Stack, as I said. My contact details are here, and if you have any other questions, please do get in contact.